I'll try to give you a sense of what um, what we mean by conceptual emergency and why we think it's very important to actually face it and take it on. Um, the uh, what was clear to the folks who met in 2001 was that we were dealing with a scale of change on a planetary level that was unprecedented and that in governance and economics and sustainability and in consciousness, those four areas seem to be in the state of, tr of transition and uh, of change on a scale that none of the ways of understanding the world that we'd all inherited were adequate to get our arms around it. And that suddenly we had a world, as, as, as Graham said, that we didn't understand and that we had no real ways of understanding it. And the, um, the concern for us was that in those kinds of moments, and there have been moments like this historically before, where all of the givens of identity, of, of, of social organization, of commerce, commercial organization, religious organization, where they were all, as I put it, put into the blender and somebody presses the button, this has happened before. Um, but at this point, it's happening on a global scale, and it's happening in multiple contexts with multiple frames of reference through which to understand that situation. And so in a sense, some of the people, like, you know, people like Karen Armstrong, but also some of the economists are talking about this kind of moment as being um, a moment when all of the rules that we use to navigate life are up for grabs. And that this is a pregnant moment, as Karen Armstrong refers to it, as an axial moment, a moment when all of the social uh, contracts be begin to be reworked. And um, as far as we were um, uh, working together, recognizing and that nobody seemed to be really addressing this, the scale of it, the possible outcomes of it, the possible consequences of it. And so the group was really brought together to bring our various um, takes on that, and with not with a view that we would necessarily come up with any answers, but that we would try to identify what some of the, some of the questions might be, and then some of the ways in which we might conduct an inquiry together in uh, what that is, uh, is is bringing. And in particular, we were focusing on what we referred to as this capacity gap a gap between <coughs> the capacities that, we, we, it's important that we started out in St. Andrews because our original conversation was about the um, remembering the first enlightenment, remembering the Scottish enlightenment as the conceptual paradigm which framed Western democratic societies and our science and our uh, moral, uh, uh, moral understandings was to some degree birthed in St. Andrews. And so we felt that um, St. Andrews would be a good place to take a look at the possibility of a second enlightenment, recognizing that a change of that magnitude was probably called for, that coming up with ways of understanding and conceptualizing life <coughs> and cope with the global context. And so we originally started out thinking about this as a project to very modestly <laughs> To, 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 uh, <laughs> to the second enlightenment. <laughs> the problem with that, there's a million problems with that, not the least of which is that the metaphor of light seemed itself to be an enlightenment metaphor, and that if we really wanted to move beyond that kind of thinking, we were going to need to move to other kinds of metaphors that would accept darkness and would accept the, the non-rational as well as the rational that would accept other ways of knowing, kin kinesthetic ways of knowing, uh, ritual ways of knowing that actually are very much a part of our lives but not very much a part of the official version of our lives. So we sort of gradually dropped the notion of second enlightenment and were willing to sit in the mess of the conceptual emergency. Um, and that my take in this is that I'm a psychologist and that my 
a great deal of my career has been working with individuals and families and groups struggling with precisely this, a conceptual emergency, struggling with those moments when nothing makes sense. This moment when all of the anchors of identity and motivation and organization and desire, all of those are suddenly um, meaningless. And in those moments when there's either too much meaning or not enough mo meaning, we can recognize as psychologists that there's various kinds of responses in those moments. And some of those responses are quite scary. Some of those responses can be, um, we refer to them as neurotic responses, when you, you try to control the chaos and try to batten down the hatches and say, let's just keep on doing what we've always done, only do it better and harder and longer and faster. Mm -hmm. And that neurotic response is a way to somehow control and contain the anxiety, whether it be personal anxiety or cultural anxiety, that comes from those moments of un, uncontrollable mess. The a worse response to that kind of moment is even more violent, is even more destructive, is even more chaotic. And we all, between us, have different, different examples of those kinds of, I would call them pathological responses to those moments of, dis, of, of, of potential disintegration. But we also, all of us recognize, and all anybody that's ever worked in the psychological world knows, is that those moments are also pregnant with real transformation. Those are often very innovative moments. Those are moments when all of the paradoxes can get reconciled and reworked into larger and better and more flexible and adaptive new possibilities. And so what we've been interested in is what can people who are aware and awake to this moment, what can we do to make it more likely that people will find the innovative and transformational route out of this high level of anxiety? One of the things I said to Graham today is that we know that people will not stay in anxiety very long. We cannot tolerate it. We're not capable of tolerating it very long. We'll do something to get rid of it. And often we will do very destructive things. Mm -hmm. And we were talking, I was talking with, uh, with Neil about fundamentalisms of various kinds mm -hmm. is a, re a neurotic response to this level of un uncertainty, this level of disorganization. Um, so is violence, so is um, acting out, so is nihilism. There are lots of pathological responses. But there are also, pos there are also innovative and creative responses. So the 10 things to do in a conceptual emergency are, in a sense, our answer to what kinds of things did we find people doing. They weren't things that we figured out, I, don't, I might say. They were what we were hearing from people who were in these kinds of settings, in, in these kinds of moments, in these kinds of experiences. And what were they learning about what worked for them, what seemed to hold the creativity and the potential for effective action and effective um, moving the story forward and in a kind of a, 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 a heuristic, heuristically, what were people learning about how to, um, how to live in the mess that we seem to be in, but without becoming frozen or reactive or compulsive. And so it's, in a nutshell, that's really what we were trying to do in our work together and also what we were trying to do with